Good evening. Good evening. So uh, just a, a quick note, um, our speaker, Dr. Tabor, said it, it might be more comfortable for some people uh, to come closer to the screen because some of the screens are harder to read. So if you feel comfortable and want to move now, go right ahead. Um, otherwise, you can take your chances and move later. It's really, we're all casual here. Um, Good evening. I'm Executive Director Tracy Glab, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Sheppy Dog Fund Lecture. Tonight, we have Dr. James Tabor with us for a presentation on the search for the lost Shapira Dead Sea Scroll. Was it genuine or a modern forgery? The Sheppy Dog Fund Lecture Series was established in 2012 by Dr. Alan Klein to address the topics of art, religion, and history prior to the 19th century. Thank you, Alan, for continuing to bring these wonderful lectures to the FIA. And I would like to remind you that the next Sheppy Dog Lecture is Wednesday, December 7th, so about a month from today with Rocky Ruggiero, I'll get his pronunciation right by the time he gets here, um, speaking on Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper, and the Art of Throwing a Great Dinner Party. So we're pretty excited about that, especially you know to kick off the holiday season. Um, before we bring Dr. Tabor to the stage, as always, we'd like to take the opportunity to thank the citizens of Genesee County. So that's why we're all asking for your zip code out there. We report to the county on uh, people who come here from both in county and out of county. It helps us um, in reporting. And thank you so much for voting for the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Millage, which provides free entry to the FIA seven days a week for Genesee County citizens. Thank you so much. Now please take a moment to silence your electronic devices. You're in for a treat tonight. Dr. James Tabor's PhD is from University of Michigan. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I got Michigan on the brain, uh, sorry. University of Chicago. <laughs> um, just this year, he retired uh, as biblical scholar and professor of ancient Judaism and early Christianity in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at, at Charlotte where he taught since 1989 and served as chair from 2004 to 2014. Um, some of you might be wondering why we changed the date in the original brochure was November 2nd, but Dr. Tabor asked us to extend it to today because he just got back from Israel, right? Just a couple days ago. So uh, we're very glad that he made it here to Flint tonight. So please, without further ado, please join me in a warm Flint welcome for Dr. James Tabor. So, good evening. Is that too loud? I can step back. So, jet lagged, but very excited to talk about Dead Sea Scrolls here. Dead Sea Scrolls, by definition, are scrolls found around the Dead Sea, the lowest spot on Earth. But in this particular case, the dates are really interesting because we're going back to 1878. Now, when this scroll was found, it caused international excitement all over Europe, particularly and in the United States. And I'll give you more of the story as we go on. So I'm going to call it a Dead Sea Scroll, but another name would be the owner, Moses Shapira, a Jerusalem resident of the late 19th century, who bought it from the Bedouin. Now, if you know anything about the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, that's 1947. So think about this. Dead Sea Scrolls, let's see, we bought it from Bedouin. And where did the Bedouin get it? Shapira's told by the uh, chief of the Bedouin tribe, found in a cave on the Dead Sea, wrapped in linen with a sticky substance around it. 1947, Dead Sea Scrolls, found in caves, wrapped in linen 
with the sticky substance. But it's fake, finally. Why? Because nothing could be preserved that long, even in the desert, with the wind and the rain and the deterioration. It must be a forgery. So I'm going to tell you that story. Okay, I've got a, I'm going to do two gun feet here with my laser pointer. This is, these are newspaper accounts uh, from 1883, published in the London papers, where Shapiro was presenting the scroll to scholars. Even the Prime Minister Gladstone went and was happy that he could read a little bit of it. He'd been studying a little bit of Hebrew. Uh, so that's not the scroll, but it's a drawing of the scroll like a newspaper would make. When it first began to get re-examined, as I'll tell you in a minute, uh, you see that's a, a piece of it right there. People said, well, that letter's wrong, and that letter's wrong, and that can't be right, because that's not how you make this or that letter. It's a newspaper artist imagining what it might look like. He's not looking at the scroll, so we had to point that out. Anyway, this is March 10th, 2021, just last year. When you get something on the front page of the New York Times, you're in, as we said in Texas where I grew up, you're in high cotton, right? Because, and I think that's what Alan probably read, he can tell us, and he thought, wow, that's an interesting topic. I wonder who knows anything about it, and somehow I got picked. Uh, now, you can go online, and I really encourage you to do this after the lecture. Fortunately, the New York Times will let you even read a free article if you're not a subscriber. And the best search would be uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, Shapira. You know, just throw in a few words, you'll get it immediately. And it's a beautiful article that unfolds with full color pages and tells the whole story. But I'm going to tell you more than that because we've been investigating. Now, guess what happened in February? I've got to get my pointer straight. February, notice the dates. Ross Nichols published a book. I wrote the preface. You can't probably see it if you're way back. That says Professor James D. Tabor. Beautiful cover called The Moses Scroll. So it's a book about this lost scroll found in 1878 in a cave above the Dead Sea. He didn't know the New York Times was going to have a cover story. When I first saw it, I thought, Ross, they found your book and they did a cover story on it. It's going to hit the Times bestseller list tomorrow. You'll be number one. Unfortunately for Ross, I'm just joking because he was just glad for any publicity. It was about a scholar, Idan Dershowitz, Hebrew University, PhD, expert on ancient Hebrew writing, going all the way, basically biblical texts and all ancient texts, uh, just an amazingly uh, talented scholar, Idan Dershowitz, who's at the University of Potsdam, head of the Department of Hebrew Bible in Germany, just south of Berlin. And that is March 10th, the day the paper came out. So the paper story is about, this is the academic book, this is the popular book. Uh, you can get this free. These, these academic books normally cost like $250. I mean, this is typical, they're made for libraries. But this one, the publisher has made it free. If you go to academia.edu, you can download it. Or you can download the article he wrote, if you want a quicker read, that is also there at his, his site, academia.edu. If you don't know the website, it's, you're going to surf forever if you go there, if you're interested in any, actually any academic subject. But the areas I work in, everybody I know is po po posting their material. So how did the, why did the Times pick it up? Idan has more pull with the Times, I guess, than Nichols does. Uh, he was at Harvard University as a visiting professor and so forth, and uh, he knew reporters there, and they just got very intrigued with the story and ran it. And it was, it was just a great story for the Times to run. But the academic book and the article, and the article's not so academic that you, you couldn't make sense of it if you're out of the field. So I really, you know, get 
You might as well download the book itself because you can look through it. It's a PDF. But definitely read the article. And then read Ross's book. Ross's book is a page turner. It's telling the story. It's so thrilling. He and I together did a lot of the research. Uh, I was working on another book, but we would talk probably three times a week. Oh, I found this. I found this. And to Berlin, got original correspondence, all these original documents that Shapira had written and so forth, really delving into the story. And there's no book like Ross's book on telling the story of the scroll. So he got the scholarship in the popular account. Immediately, it got all kinds of attention. Here's uh, Israeli newspapers and different blogs. And this was my blog. Notice the date is... I, um, uh, Saturday the 13th of March to Friday the 19th, it got my blog about it got 8,000 views. So you can see what's happening. Dead Sea Scrolls are magic. It's kind of a magic term. So let's talk about the man. This is the only surviving photograph of him. I think we'll find more. Now that we're on the trail of the Shapira scroll, which has disappeared, if you know anything about it. You know, we got, was it a forger? We got to find it. Uh, but this is the only photograph. We have descriptions of him. He's Jewish, did you guess? But he converted to Christianity when he got to the Holy Land, even on his way there. He was, a mess, he was disappointed in uh, waiting for a Messiah. He was born in 1830. This is now Ukraine. It was Poland then, but it's actually part of Ukraine. His father had traveled to Palestine, which is the Holy Land, in 1840, leaving the family behind. He was 10 years old. And in the 1850s, Moses followed with his grandfather. Now, why are they walking to the Holy Land? This is even before Zionism had developed in the 1880s, 1890s. The Hasidic movement in Poland, in this area of Poland, had predicted that the Messiah would arrive in 1840, and he went down to meet the Messiah. It's one of the Messianic movements of Judaism. There are very few, because so far all Messiahs have not turned out too well, right? But uh, in fact, there was nobody even there that said, I'm the guy, as far as I know. But it was a major thing at the time. He followed looking for his father. He converted to Christianity. He became part of Christ Church. Uh, Conrad Schick is a famous name of the time that he worked with at Christ Church, which is the Anglican church in the old city. It's still there. He married uh, Rosette, who was German. They had two daughters, Augusta and Maria. So that's the man. This is what it looked like if you walked in Jaffa Gate. Who's been to Jerusalem? Some of you have. I know you went to Jaffa Gate, and that main gate as you go in on the uh, west side. Uh, so that's a photograph actually taken uh, the year that he arrived, just to give you the feeling of the craziness. Mark Twain went in 1878, so just, you know, kind of to give you a comparison. If you've read Innocence Abroad, you know the story of that. This is Christ Church. No crosses, no Christian symbols. It uh, looks like a synagogue. Some of you are Jewish. Uh, you look at that and you think, hmm, there's nothing in here that uh, would be offensive to Jews, really. Services are in Hebrew. And it's not this sort of Jews for Jesus, Messianic Jewish thing. It's much more intellectual than that. Hey, it's Anglican, right? And so it's, it's Church of England, but in the Holy Land, trying to allow the Hebraic atmosphere to come through. Uh, so it was very pioneering. Uh, bishop Gobat was the Anglican bishop. Shapira eventually started his own uh, antiquities business. This was the back of the shop uh, by the pool here. And this is what the street looked like then. Notice Moses Shapira, bookseller and antiquarian, correspondent to the British Museum. He began traveling east in Yemen in Saudi Arabia, and what is now Jordan. Remember, Jordan didn't exist then, uh, but just on the east side of the Jordan. And he would find manuscripts and collect documents and buy them from traders and so forth. 
And the British Museum bought dozens and dozens, I think over time, over a hundred of his manuscripts. It was mainly Torah scrolls that were going into ruin uh, and saving them then and so forth. So if you go to the British Museum, a lot of the old scrolls you'll see are Shapira scrolls. So he was allowed to actually put up the sign and claim to be part of the British Museum, which is incredibly prestigious in the 1870s. This is his shop today. I love going in there and just imagining, because I've read all of his letters and correspondence. I, I've lived in the 19th century for the past year or so working with Ross, and I'm also working on another book on Mary, the mother of Jesus, so I'm jumping around 1900 years, but it's easy to do. And the, the people in it today don't know anything about Shapiro. They do now because of all the people. Is this Shapiro's shop? I read about it in the New York Times. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're just Christian Arabs that live there. And now they say, I, I guess we're kind of famous because he was here. You know? So uh, now where were they found? The Dead Sea Scrolls that you're familiar with were found up on the north, on the northwest side of the Dead Sea. This is 1,200 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is 2,400 feet above sea level. I'm from North Carolina. I mean, I li lived there 33 years. If you know Boone or Appalachian State, 2,400 feet above sea level, beginning of the uh, Appalachian Mountains. This is 1,200 feet below. So when you go down the road, any of you do that? I know you said you've... Ears popping, you're going to the lowest spot on earth. I always stop at a bar with my students just for fun. It's called the lowest bar on earth. <laughs> Welcome to the lowest bar on earth. Why is it so amazing? Because of the preservation of uh, the lack of moisture in the desert. And so scrolls were, we now know, preserved in the caves. I won't go into the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now this particular scroll, the Bedouin said, Remember, Shapiro's living here, and he's going across and traveling all over the place and was involved in several major discoveries. But this is called the Arnon in the Bible, or Wadi Mujib today, in a cave right by Eor, which we can't locate the cave yet, but we're going to, because we need to go back to the cave because there's probably other manuscripts there. And, you know, people haven't really looked and so uh, I say we, I'll tell you about the we in a minute. But that's where the Bedouin found it, and they gave the description of the cave. It's 1878. That's what it actually looks like. That's an artist's drawing of it. So look, you're not going to kind of run down here, right? But see all the caves, cave, 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 cave? Looks just like the Dead Sea. It's pretty rugged. You'd have to uh, use ropes and climbing equipment and drop down, but it can be done. Uh, at that same period, two things were found. Uh, Tracy just told me she went through Hezekiah's tunnel and the inscription of Hezekiah's tunnel, it was ripped off the wall. Were you told that was a replica? Okay, good, I'm glad your guide didn't mislead you. But it gave us some of our early examples of how you write what's called Paleo-Hebrew, the alphabet. Some people call it Phoenician. But also the Mesha or the Moabite stone became a kind of a Rosetta Stone for this as well. So these are genuine things written around the time of maybe the Moses Scroll. So if the Moses Scroll, I'm going to call it, Dershowitz call it the valediction of Moses. Most people don't use that word. That means the final address of Moses, like a, like a valedictorian, right? He's giving his final speech. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses literally... It's the only place in the Torah, the five books of Moses, that use first person for Moses. All the other books say, and Moses said, and then quote him. But in the valediction, he says, I did this, I did that. We came here first person all the way through. That's how this scroll is as well. But these are mainly valuable to begin to study the letters of this period and try to date the letters of what we call Paleo-Hebrew. So he bought them in August 1878. Uh, he called them the strips from the Bedouin, and he sent copies to a German scholar, Schlottmann, at the University of Halle. Schlottmann was a theologian, a Christian theologian, Hebrew Bible scholar, who got them, and he said, you know, it has a version of the Ten Commandments that's different from our Bible, 
How dare you even give this any attention? Whoever wrote it, whenever it was, it's absolutely worthless because it doesn't conform to our Bible. Now, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls now. You know, we have lots of copies of Isaiah, of Deuteronomy, different variant readings, right? It's not exactly like the standard Masoretic text that is basically from the 10th century CE or AD. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are from the 2nd century BC, so they're actually earlier texts and renditions. Scholars have been studying that for 75 years. He was so rebuked by Schlotman that he put it in a vault for five years, and I think he was a sincere, pious Christian Jew who thought, you know, maybe I am displeasing God by reading a version of the Ten Commandments that's not exactly what we have in the Bible. Well, guess what? Did you know there's two versions in the Bible? And God spoke, Deuteronomy 5, Exodus 20, and God spoke, put them side by side, they're not the same. So what did God speak? It's a little hard to be a fundamentalist if you start comparing texts. If by fundamentalist you mean what the Protestants later meant, that everything's the same, because everything isn't the same, right? Most people know that from reading the Bible. And, but then he read a book... Uh, he read a book on Hebrew Bible criticism by liberal scholars in Germany, and he just, it was a book by Frederick Bleek. Let me get my pointer right. Oh, I knew that would happen. Oh, boy, I went ahead five slides there. Here we go. Uh, and Bleek was saying, you know, the oldest versions of Deuteronomy probably had the f following elements. And Shapiro says, to himself, because he's translated the Paleo-Hebrew. He, he, he was a really good Hebrew scholar. And he said, that's what's in the scroll that the Bedouins sold me. What he sang was the original version of Deuteronomy, and the version we have is an edited and later version with other traditions. Could this be the original Deuteronomy? And he got excited. And so he wrote to another professor in Berlin, Strzok, who actually, uh, and he took these fragments and showed them to Strzok in Berlin and Strzok said, I have no interest in this. It's probably a forgery. Don't even pay it attention. But when he took it to a young scholar named uh, Goethe at Leipzig, all 16 fragments, and he left them with him and let him study them. Uh, and I'll get back to him in a, uh, again. So we'll, we'll talk about Goethe. Now, why was Shapira under any suspicion? Because he had sold these statues called the Moabitica because they're from Moab. And notice, this was a display in Israel today, the year 2000. Truly fake, Moses William Shapira, does it say Master Forger? I'm, at, I'm at reading at an angle, right? Israel Museum. And they had a display of all these things that he sold and he sold them to the Germans. He made a good deal of money. It'd be equivalent to $200,000 today. It was 115 pieces. They do look pretty strange. Here's one that uh, Dr. Gibson, a friend of mine, uh, was able to obtain. You can buy them here and there. There's so many around Europe. And I'm holding it and looking at it. But on the other hand, these are genuine from the dig where you work. Uh, Dr. Coxon is with us and his wife, Lexi. Uh, you recognize these, don't you, uh, Duane? Because these were dug at Biblical Tamar down in the south, where I just came from. And these are Edomite uh, gods. And they're a little bit grotesque, I'll have to say. But some of these were exaggerated. So they were basically declared all to be forgeries. Now, Schlotman, who had bought them originally, He's the one that rejected the scroll at Hala. He never agreed that they were all forgeries. He says, yeah, once we started buying them, there, there are craftsmen in Jerusalem going, oh, I can make one of those. And some of them do have exaggerated sexual attributes because they're fertility gods. But I think the forgers went all out, <laughs> as you can see here. And they became... Now, when we look at these today, don't you see the difference in these and these? Well, the one I was looking at right here 
That actually is not some crazy leering face. It looks very much like the kind of Edomite, Moab uh, crafts. I don't believe uh, Shapira forged these uh, figurines, but it got out of hand. But anyway, that label stuck with him, even though he wasn't accused of doing it. And once it was declared a forgery, he, he got the name forgery. Uh, it's Shapira the forger, master forger, faker. His life was ruined. And you're going to hear the story of that as we go on. So this is the German group. There are four Germans, Hermann Goethe, Edward Meyer, uh, George Ebers, and Adolf Ehrman. Uh, Ebers, these are young guys that are just starting out their academic careers. And Shapira gave the 16 strips to Goethe, and Meyer has helped him. But what we now have is their correspondence. We got their original correspondence back and forth between each other, and it's amazing. They actually were so blown away by it, uh, and uh, thinking that it is genuine, that they, uh, I'm gonna give you some quotes in a minute. They, this is what they laid out, the strips. This is in Ross's book, you can read it. But it, it was uh, panels of 16 different strips, and this is another arrangement where we've tried to reconstruct it because we don't have it anymore. So Goethe wrote, he wrote this book in German. It's now translated. You can get it on Amazon if you want to read his original book. He worked at this hotel for a week or so very intensely transcribing it and translating it. And the Germans started saying this, the writing, that means Shapiro's manuscript, is wonderful stands between Misa and the Esmunazar, that's another inscription. It's different from the Shaloa inscriptions, that's Hezekiah's tunnel, uh, with shapes that the most skilled paleographer could not invent so beautifully and correctly. The orthography is very real. Meyer to Ebers, 8th of July, 1883. Now, you'll understand this now because of that Moabitica stuff. Uh, Ebers is the older scholar who's kind of cautioning the young boys. You know, when, if you don't have tenure, don't go out on a rail and take a stand for something that could be a little shaky. The young boys, these are guys in their 20s that just got their doctorates in Germany. So he says, the Moabitica are scarecrows. He, lovely, lovely image. The Moabit, those statues, those grotesque statues, many of which were fake, they're scarecrows, which keep clever sparrows away from the good fruit. If there, I'm at an angle here, sorry. If there are such, if there are such. Now what he's telling them is be careful. Don't get identified with Shapira the forger, but don't be scared away if there's really good fruit. Later he writes, when he sees that, he takes a train and, and sees the uh, scrolls themselves, and he says, uh, if these are fake, I will eat uh, my, my leather. It, it, we're not even sure if it means eat my, probably the equivalent of eat my hat. You know, and was, he became totally convinced they were genuine. So Shapiro was pretty excited. Finally, a committee met in Berlin, and they decided, they met for 15, 20 minutes. He was offering to sell it to the museum. And the older scholars at the uh, Berlin Museum decided not to buy it, and several of them said it's probably fake. How could it have survived uh, 1,800 years? So then he went to London. So he's trying to shop it. <laughs> and he goes to London, and two scholars got involved, uh, Christian David Ginsburg and uh, Clermont Ganneau. British, French. Clermont Ganneau is the one who exposed the Moabitica as forgery. So he's after Shapira. Says, oh, now he's got something else he's trying to pan off to the academic world. So he was just against it from the start. And he claimed that it was a forgery before he even saw it. He said, I can't wait to get to London and show you how fake this is. And Ginsburg wouldn't let him come in the lab and see them where he was working. And Ginsburg was, I think, becoming very convinced that they were genuine. He was appointed by the British government 
to uh, work on the scroll. This is some of the publicity that appeared here, Scientific American, all the different drawings. Uh, tremendous attention. When finally Ginsburg declared that he thought it is probably forged as well, Shapiro was in great despair and Punch Magazine published this terrible cartoon characterizing Shapira in a very Nazi-like way, even though it was 1883. Uh, and Ginsburg, who's also Jewish, by the way, uh, who should, he should have made him look the same, who's kind of catching the thief, like you didn't fool us. Uh, I can't tell you too much more about that, but I'll just say very quickly, I think there's evidence that Ginsburg st always wondered till the end of his life whether they were really real, because he started off thinking they were. But what Claremont Gano said is they're cut off the bottom of a Torah scroll, and he just snipped off the bottom and then forged it. And he said, look at the curve. Now let's talk about, this is a letter that Shapiro wrote from Amsterdam. He's in despair. It's very good to read because you can show how utterly sincere he is. And he's writing to the British Museum and he's very respectful and we have all of his correspondence and I've read all of his letters and there's so much evidence to me that uh, his story holds up and is true. Doesn't mean I think it means that the Bedouin found it, it wouldn't tell you the date or anything like that because we still have to decide that. Anyway, I just put that up to show and you can see the date. September 14th, 1883, he leaves the country. There have been several books written on him, but he's mostly been ignored. This is the Prime Minister of Israel, former Lapid, right? You recognize the name? That's his mother, Shulamit Lapid, wrote a novel in 1884. Uh, in 1984, not 18. Uh, he, she's not a, that old. And uh, Yoram Shapiro, this is a film you can watch online. I would really recommend it. This is his book. But it's called Shapira and I, and it's a documentary film. You can, you can find it if you Google it. And then his daughter, Miriam Harry, wrote a novel. So these are accounts that help us uh, recover some of the story. But then... Once the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, these are New York Times stories. One of you mentioned Allegro to me. John Allegro, who wrote The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross and was involved in the Dead Sea Scrolls scholar scholarship, uh, he's saying we need to re-examine the Shapira scroll because now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls from caves and they are 2,000 years old and maybe we threw out something very valuable and it falsely accused Shapira. So here's some of the articles. Um, here's Allegro, his quote, I'm not going to read all these for sake of time. Uh, there, before Allegro, there was uh, Mansour, 1956. He, he concludes that neither the internal nor the external evidence supports the idea of forgery, and there is justification for a re-examination. John Allegro, 1965. In brief, there's no longer any doubt that Shapiro's parchments were genuine. The fate of the precious Shapiro strips is warning us not to let negations, no matter how great their reputations, perpetuate irreparable damage. Actually, that's Cyrus Gordon. Um, I read, the, but uh, Allegro wrote a book. The quote is from Cyrus Gordon. Other things came out. So people basically began to argue, let's look again. And you can notice the dates. Uh, the latest uh, was 2017, but these are 95 and then back to uh, 74, 65. Until that time story appeared, it didn't really get much attention. Here's the reasons. He, he, he forged the Moabite pottery and made a bunch of money. Manuscripts could not survive. It's cut from the bottom of a Torah skull. And the paleography shows signs of forgery. Well, according to those German scholars, they were jumping around the room about it, that it was genuine. And the Hebrew content and syntax is questionable. But remember, at that time, we had very few examples of how Paleo-Hebrew would write. Uh, once the scrolls came out, this is the famous article by Edmund Wilson in The New Yorker, The Scrolls from the Dead Sea, 
people begin to say, should we re-examine the Shapira scroll? And then somebody said, where is it? It disappeared. Okay, and I'm going to tell you what happened to it tonight. Here's a Dead Sea Scroll, and it's uh, actually called The Last Words of Moses. So the genre of having a scroll giving the last words of Moses, for sure, is not a forgery. This is a genuine Dead Sea Scroll from Cave One. It's fragment number 22. And it is uh, the last words of Moses, just like the Shapira Scroll. Okay? Here is uh, Paleo-Hebrew in some of the scrolls, and you can compare the letters and see the similarities. As far as a curved scroll, here we have a copy of Leviticus, and notice they've written it on a curved manuscript, which is the same curve as the Shapira scroll. And if you cut off the bottom of a Torah scroll, you wouldn't have this curve. So we know that they did cut leather strips with this effect of, of, of curving. We have several examples of it. So the curved article uh, doesn't really uh, work, I think. Uh, there's another example of Paleo-Hebrew on papyri, just to show you that we have. This was a great find. It was in 1979. It's silver. It's a silver amulet, and it has the blessing of the priests. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Churches use it today. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, right? Shine his countenance upon you and give you peace. And it was found in an excavation in Jerusalem in the Valley of Hinnom. And that's a wonderful example of the Paleo-Hebrew. So by 1979, we're getting more and more examples where we need to rewrite. I mean, we need to re-examine this scroll. Now, here's the, the kind of like key to the mystery. Dershowitz, looking through a collection or catalog of Shapira's work that he sent uh, over the years to the British Museum, all the manuscripts, he was a great, uh, you know, keeper of records, and he'd say, number 333, it's this, it has these letters, uh, and these are genuine manuscripts. There's, there are three pages written in purple ink just on writing paper. And it turns out this is Shapira's own handwriting, and it contains the notes when he's first trying to decipher the scroll. And you can tell by reading these notes. And if you read that article by Dershowitz that's free, he goes through, he shows you the pictures, and he shows you how it's not the work of a forger, it's the work of somebody trying to figure out and read it and translate it to send it to that German scholar Schlottmann. And at this point, he's making mistakes and sometimes correcting them and sometimes not. And if he's forging, he would just make it as clear as possible. You know, but you can read Dershowitz's arg argument. These are made the year he found the strips, the year he bought them. He bought them for a very small amount from the Bedouin, just what we would call a few dollars. Uh, so we actually have three pages of his handwritten notes and actually, some things can be done with this, believe it or not, with advanced techniques, because he's touching the scroll and reading it and writing, touching the scroll and reading it and writing it. So what occurs to you? Not his DNA. We could get that, I think. But what else? If you're touching leather, writing, touching leather, writing. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that we're beginning to study. What happened to the scrolls? They were bought at an auction by Dr. Philip Brooks Mason. They were sold by Sotheby's, uh, and then they were bought at an auction. And uh, the, aux the auction was uh, a bookseller in London. And Philip Brooks Mason bought them. He lived in Burton-on-Trent, whoops. And he died in 1903. And he was a, we found this, actually, there's a scholar, uh, a researcher named Matthew Hamilton in Australia that discovered this, because we didn't know what happened. People said, well, maybe they burnt in a fire, and maybe they went here and we went there. But in Mason's uh, obituary, it lists his expertise as collecting plants and shells and all kinds of flora and fauna from the history of England. He corresponded with Charles Darwin and so forth. 
He's, he's really quite famous as a collector. And then at the bottom of the ossuary, I'm at the obituary, ossuary, I got ossuaries on my mind this week from Israel. At the bottom of the obituary it says, and among his other distinctions was he was the owner of the famous Shapira scrolls. So we've traced them to him. And I didn't do that, that was Matthew Hamilton. And that was a huge breakthrough. So we've actually got a trail now. And he died in 1903, we have his will, we have his widow's will, we have a whole lot of information. This is in Ross's book particularly. And here's the last reference that we have where there's a society in Burton-on-Trent, which is north of London, the Society of History and Archaeological uh, Discovery, and they would meet and have meetings kind of like this, you know, getting together as groups reporting on things. And on March the 8th, 1889, Mason, it says, is going to show the infamous Shapira scrolls. So he actually showed them publicly to a gathered group that came together. And at the end of the lecture, uh, I'm going to give you time for questions, but just in a few minutes, I'm going to uh, repeat that for you, okay? You're going to be the first audience ever to see what uh, he showed them, okay? So what, did I bring it with me or what? Did we find it? Not quite, but anyway. Uh, so just to keep you awake. Uh, this article you can get at academia.edu if you go to my page uh, or Dershowitz, we co-wrote it. Here's the long version of the case for authenticity, and I, I just think it's amazingly strong. Two other scholars, my friends, my colleagues, wrote the case for forgery. So both articles appeared, Biblical Archaeology Review, some of you probably subscribe. You can download it free and read both articles. You make the judgment as much as you can. But I think it's a really strong case that they are authentic. This is Dershowitz. If you go to hillelharvard.edu, uh, you have a wonderful question and answer session where he's discussing, is it a clumsy forgery or the oldest biblical manuscript in existence? Dershowitz claims that it's older than our Dead Sea Scrolls by several hundred years. So it would, in fact, be the oldest copy of any biblical manuscript on the planet if we could find it and prove it. It could be carbon dated. Uh, later, I mean, I'm not going to read this to you, but I want you to see. This is Ross's English translation. And here you have the version of the Ten Commandments. It's a little bit different from ours. You've also got love God with all your heart. If you're Jewish, you know this. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu. Uh, Hero Israel, Elohim, our Elohim. Elohim is one. You shall love Elohim. Your Elohim with all your heart, all your soul, very exceedingly, and so forth. It also has the blessings and the cursings. If you remember, when Israel comes in the land, they have blessings and cursings. So it purports to be the last speech of Moses, some of which we have in our Deuteronomy. But, but this also has other material. So Shapira once said in his letters, the sin of believing in a false document is not much greater than disbelieving the truth. You got to think about that for a minute. So this is what he wrote to uh, some of his critics as he was telling them, think about this. Edward Bond was at the British Museum. This is a composite picture of him. So I say, if you're interested in this, read the scroll. Read Ross's book, Ross Nichols. Re download Dershowitz's material. Read my bar article that you saw with Dershowitz. Here's our team, Edan Dershowitz, Ross Nichols, David and Patty Tyler, uh, that are good friends and donors to our cause and help us a lot. Matthew Hamilton, who discovered the last owner of it, and Dr. James Tabor, that's me. We formed this very tight team, and we are on the case, believe me. We're searching wills, we're following it up. You read uh, Kanan Tagay's book. He, you know, it's called, uh, what is it, The Lost Book of Moses? He finally gave up the search. We've used, we, we know him and we talked to him, but we are able to pursue some other clues 
that he did not have, that have now come out now that we have more information. Uh, the Tylers and Nichols have made two trips to England, two trips to Germany. This is what I'm going to do now that I'm retired. I'm going to spend a lot of time in Germany. I think the scroll is in England, but Shapira's wife sent a fragment of it to Schlopman, even though he's the guy who said, how dare you, uh, because she, uh, Shapira died. Some say he committed suicide. That was certainly in the reports. I'm not sure how he died. It's, it's mysterious. Let's, maybe he did, that he took his own life in despair. But there could be arguments against that as well, if we really wanted to get conspiratorial, right? Which we won't do tonight. But anyway, um, she sent a fragment to Schlotman, and when German scholars die, they have what they call their Nachlass. It's their research uh, materials. And that's at his university in storage. And it's about 30 shells from ceiling to floor. And my guess is that fragment is in there. And we will go just look through them. Because it, she sent it in a, a package. And I don't think he would have thrown it away. Probably just thought it was interesting and all the publicity. And she said, maybe you should have this. At least you believe my husband on the Moabitica. And he was not a forger. Uh, so uh, the dream here is that uh, we'll put him on the Israeli money someday as the great discoverer and uh, maybe name a street after him in Jerusalem. You know, in Judaism, the thing that we often say, or Jew I'm not Jewish, but is often said is the worst sin is Lashon Hara, really. It's the evil tongue, because you can destroy a person's life with your words. It's also in the New Testament, in the book of James, right? Some of you who are Christian know that. And it's also things that Jesus says in the Gospels. So if he truly is a sincere person and bought the scroll and didn't lie and just wanted to bring it to the attention of scholars and he was before his time, which I'm... 90% convinced is the case from especially the purple letters when you read them because uh, he's really working on it you know it's like you picture him sweating over it and his daughter by the way in her book about him says dad's upstairs again reading that scroll trying to figure it out you know and she's just reporting you know what a kid would say he's always up in his study reading that scroll trying to figure it out so um I would like to see his life vindicated, but, and that's a worthy cause, but you know what else? If this is the oldest biblical manuscript ever found, then it belongs to the world and we need to recover it. And I think we, I think we have a good chance of recovering it. The copy that Mason had was most likely passed on in the family, and he gave all of his books and his research papers that weren't dealing with shells and insects and flora and fauna, which he was an expert on. He was more of a botanist. Uh, he gave them to his nephew, who is a minister. And now we've tracked his nephew down and his will. And I think we can go to England and just, I think it would probably stay in the family. Remember, Hanan said, it's probably in somebody's attic somewhere in England. And I think it probably is. But either way, we can try to find this one strip. What will we do? You would do carbon dating on the leather and also carbon dating on the ink. Remember the recent scrolls that were on old leather, but they had faked them, and they were in the Bible, the Bible Museum in D.C.? And now they've removed them, exposed as fakes. They're very well done. But they, they, use, they didn't have ancient ink. How do you get ancient ink? That's pretty hard. You can find old leather, but it's hard to find ancient ink. So uh, you would be able to date it. And if it is maybe 500 years before the time of Jesus, then it would be quite significant. But I did have the slide up. Read the scroll. Uh, you, you should read it. Uh, you can find it online at Ross Nichols' page. So I'm not just trying to sell his book. 
his page, academ everything's academia.edu, Ross Nichols, he's put up his translation, compared it to our version of the Ten Commandments and discusses it. 